Hi, welcome again to the course of Structural Biology. Today we are going to class 4 and we are going to discuss about genome sequencing and the interesting phenomenon changes happened around that. We talked about the concept of dideoxynucleotide phosphate which helps us to understand how we could go for chain termination. This along with PCR amplification gives us Sanger sequencing method which as I told earlier have changed biology first time we learn how to read the biological macromolecule in the truest sense of the term. I talked about why Sanger sequencing was revolutionary and then today I will talk about the journey from a gene to an entire genome because when people got to sequence gene, they start asking more, they start to know about the entire organism's genetic content which is genome. So, gene sequencing as we talked about, it is a DNA sequencing, the process of determining the nucleic acid sequence, the order of nucleotides in DNA. It includes any method or technology that is used to determine the order of the four bases ATGC. The advent of rapid DNA sequencing methods has greatly accelerated biological and medical research and discovery. There are two methods to talk about, one is Sanger sequencing method which we talked about, another is Maxim Gilbert method uh, which is a chemical breakdown method, uh, but I do not want to talk about that because I just want to give you the sense how to do DNA sequencing and if you look at today, still now Sanger sequencing is relevant, so I talk about Sanger sequencing. In the whole genome sequencing, it is about the process of determining the complete DNA sequence of an organism's genome at one time. This generally includes the sequencing of an organism's entire chromosomal DNA, DNA content in the mitochondria and if it is plant then in the chloroplast. There are several methods like pyro sequencing, virtual terminator sequencing, solid, but I am not going into detail of that. I will rather come back to the central dogma I was talking about. Central dogma is about the relation of DNA, RNA, especially mRNA and protein. DNA as I told earlier, self replicate to form DNA, DNA through transcription make mRNA and mRNA through translation make protein. So, these three macromolecules are interconnected, but in the body, in the cell, in an organism, the function is done by protein majorly through the molecules like sugar, nucleotide, amino acids, lipids and they are forming further small molecules and these decide the function of the cell. Now, if you see the whole DNA content of the cell is called genome. The whole mRNA content of the cell is called transcriptome. The whole protein content of the cell is called proteome and the molecules generated through the action of enzymes are called metabolome. So, now you see from DNA through the replication forming DNA, from DNA through transcription making mRNA, from mRNA through translation making protein and through protein doing the function generating the metabolites, they are connected and the connection starts from the point of the DNA. So, it starts from the genome, but then from genome we get transcriptome, we get proteome and we get metabolome. So, if we could read gene and we could convert the ability of studying gene to genome, that means we could read the life. That was revolutionary and that was what we are shifting to genome. But there are challenges. If you look at in the cell, there are chromosomes and chromosomes by the help of histone are very, very closely packed. You know that there are like 
23 pairs of chromosome in human, but I am not going into that. What I am trying to say is if you open up the human genome, it is said that the distance you get, you could go to sun and come back 60 times. Forget about human genome, let us look at genomes from very small organism to plant who have bigger genome. So, first we take T2 bacteriophage which is a virus and its DNA having a size of 170,000 base pair. So, as we are talking about in Sanger sequencing, you could do 850 around nucleotides. That means, you have to perform 200 time to sequence a the one of the smallest organisms genome which is T2 bacteriophage. So, if you think in terms of money, if let us say in Sanger sequencing even today you pay let us say 1000 rupees per reaction, it is less generally, but let us say 1000, then you have to spend 200 into 1000, right, for one small T2 bacteriophage. That was the challenge. One, so one is money, second is time, third is the accuracy. When you are going for you are actually losing the accuracy. These three are very important and if you look at other genomes like bacteria at an average of 4.6 million base pairs. Drosophila, the fruit fly which you see commonly in the fruits, 130 million. Human, 3.2 billion. Canopy plant, 150 billion. So, now you understand probably there needs a massive parallel action. You cannot perform even if it is perfect, it is very accurate. You cannot utilize Sanger singly to convert your readability from gene to genome. And that is why the next generation sequencing appeared. So, what was the basic characteristics of next generation sequencing? One, the generation of many millions of short reads in parallel. As I was talking about, instead of one Sanger, if you perform parallelly 1000 Sanger, then it would be much better. The speed up of sequencing process compared to the first generation. What are the first generation? They are Maxim Gilbert and Sanger sequencing. The low cost of sequencing? And the sequencing output is directly detected without the need for electrophoresis. When it is 1000 nucleotide, you could read it by looking at that. But when you are going for such big number, you need automation, you need direct reading. So, these are the basic characteristics of NGS and how NGS work. So, first you have to develop the genomic library of DNA or RNA. So, selection of the DNA RNA which you want to sequence, first you get the target. Then you go for constructing a library which is library of fragments, nucleotide you have to construct. Then you go for preparing template, proper template for detection like you are breaking the genome into several fragments, you have to reassemble them after the sequencing. So, you have to develop proper template. Then as I told massively parallel sequencing with automated sequencer and at the end you have to analyze high throughput data analysis should be performed using either in-house if you have in-house software or commercialized software packages. So, these are the you know NGS platforms ABS Sanger, Rose, Illumina, Life Solid, Life Ion Torrent, Pack Bio, and very recently Nanopore. If you see the Sanger and Rose, ABI Sanger and Rose are called first generation, 
Illumina started from second generation life solid also, but Illumina as you could see here, they have you know they kind of develop monopoly, they have developed a lot of systems, they have updated themselves when it is required and they are still the owner of this market. Then third generation life ion torrent, pack bio, pack bio kind of between third generation and the new next generation where nanopore is used. You could look at the size of the nanopore, you could take the delivery of a nanopore sequencing machine through FedEx through you know you get the Amazon stops, you could it is that small. And with that with pack bio and nanopore now you know sequencing costs are getting lower day by day. Yes, there is still issue of accuracy. Uh, the accuracy is still now based as I told with Illumina but these guys are also coming with higher accuracy day by day. So, as I told these are the main one in the market now Illumina, Life Ion Torrent, Pack Bio and Nanopo. So, if you compare between Sanger and uh, next generation sequencing, uh, they have the advantage of construction of a sequencing library clonal amplification to generate the sequencing feature uh, in Sanger sequencing there is no in vivo cloning transformation colony picking. So, lots of you know things you could have get rid of which will help you to automate. Then array based sequencing which is higher degree of parallelism than capillary based sequencing. So, the journey from Sanger sequencing Mac or first generation sequencing to the next generation sequencing have get people towards an idea of automation in the name of human genome project which is revolutionary which is again changing the direction and speed of how biology is working. The human genome project was an international research effort to determine the sequence of the human genome and identify the genes that it contains. The Human Genome Project was an international research group from six countries US, UK, France, Germany, Japan and China and several laboratories and a large number of scientists and technicians from various disciplines taken a 13 year long effort to make it successful. Let us look at the timeline of Human Genome Project in 1970 Fred Sanger invented the DNA uh, sequencing technique we talked about that then in 1985. Robert Sinsheimer, Chancellor of the University of California Santa Cruz holds first meeting to propose sequencing the human genome with potential funders, the US Department of Energy, the US National Institute of Health NIH and UK Medical Research Council MRC. In 1986 US Department of Energy and National Institute of Health come to fund the project. In 1988 Human Genome Organization was founded. In 1989 Medical Research Council sponsored, in 1990 HGP was initiated and directed by James Watson the same person who had come up with the structure of DNA. 1993 Wellcome Trust Institute joins, 1994 they have developed Genetic Privacy Act because they have thought about the probable you know misdirection when they are doing human genome project. In 1997 National Human Genome Research Institute NHGRI was established. In 1998 Celera Genomics it is a private initiative Craig Venter and there are other groups also doing human genome project independently. In 1999 human chromosome 22 was sequenced firstly that is the first entire chromosome sequencing. 2000 working draft of the genome was completed, 2001 they published the analysis of working draft and at 2003 human genome project was completed. So, this is a collaborative venture and named as International Human Genome Sequencing Consortium or IHGSC. The main objectives among many I am just talking about few to obtain complete sequence of full DNA extracted from cells donated by several anonymous donors so as to determine the sequence of DNA in each chromosome, to construct genetic map of facilitating genetic linkage studies, 
to discover all human genes to allow further study of human genetic diseases and to develop simplified and automated technology for DNA sequencing process. Because as I told in that consortium, there are several big universities, MIT, Stanford, Caltech and all of them joined along with them, there are MNCs like uh, Illumina, like Applied Biosystem. So there was a consortium where the scientists were meeting the technologists and they were trying to develop more automation, more high throughput, more faster and more easier sequencing. So before going to look at the life changing effect of human genome, let us first discuss for a minute what people have thought when they wanted to develop the human genome project. One thing that time people did not have the entire concept of the genome being so much higher volume than the proteome. For example, human, the 100 percent genome, it is around 3 percent, it is gene. So, that concept was clearly missing. Another thing was people have idea that especially between one organism, most of the genomes are pretty identical. So, let us take between you and me, if we have let us say 99 percent identity in the genome we will wait for each other because we know that if I sequence my genome, you could read yours from that or vice versa, you do yours. So, we are like playing a game of watching, of waiting who is doing first and more importantly, the price is pretty high. So, this was the condition before the attempt of human genome project was taken. What happened after human genome project? As I told, it take 1990 to 2003. After the thing happened, it was you know published in all the uh, like esteemed dailies. Like here, I am giving you an example of New York Times. Genetic code of human life is cracked by scientists. It was regularly published in Science and Nature and it was also even considered as a small step for human to go to heaven, to be immortal. They used to think that if you get the mystery of DNA, that would help scientists to make you immortal further. And it was uh, as I told, it is 3 billion base pair, uh, which is 6 billion letters and the whole genome was recorded in just 12 CD-ROMs and think about how important it was. The then American president was present to receive the 12 CDs of the first draft of the human genome. So, effect of human genome project as they say before human genome project was started, DNA sequencing was very slow. So, you look at the PhD student defining upper panel is my four years of work like uh, only these graphs she had got in four years and that was actually the scenario when people work in gene sequencing, it was so slow. And after human genome project happened, when an angel came and talked to the God, God the human genome code is been unraveled. God is also you know like damn hackers, now I have to change the password. So, it even affect God like what happened. Before that people, the scientists, the biochemists used to work on single genes like you know Barca, actin, RAS, wind, the cancer genes, the important structural genes and all. After genome sequencing, there are development of 
departments like genomics and proteomics and they are not talking about gene they are talking about the effect of many genes in a single chromosome so the level of prediction goes a level higher and in that time as i already told the ohm word was coined so much genome proteome transcriptome a scientist was asked how do you define success in science and his answer was when i coin my own ohm word the cost as i was constantly talking about the cost was seriously going down and you know if you are standing now this is really really under our control this is one of the best slide i have seen regarding the application of next generation sequencing it could have sequence anything and everything in space in soil in water in tissues just what you need is a dna or rna so if you have dna and rna you could get information from anything and everything so i talked about the pre human genome project after human genome project the genome difference as i told about gene and non gene part is clear so now people know that the difference the tiny difference which was predicted before between one human to another human between human to chimpanzee are only based of the gene part and the non gene part is extremely different and divergent there are novel genes coming out the genes which people have studied so far are the genes we have understood are essential for our life system but many other genes are now coming out there are other factors including influencing the regulation of control in the replication level transcription level translation level cost i have already talked about and now commercialization when the cost is going lower now you spend around 100 dollars and it is possible for you to get your genome so in that situation the wait and watch game i was talking about is now changed you don't now wait for for me one thing second thing the market is now expanding when a cancer patient or a probable cancer patient is coming to a doctor the doctor is not trying to get some test to identify a gene because he or she is aware about the fact that by doing genome sequencing i get the entire picture in my hand so if the patient have a problem in a part of the tissue they take cells from there and from the healthy part and then do genome sequencing and compare and that comparative genomics have given them the real cause so this is changing the concept of biotechnology biomedical science and many others and standing here now i put a question do ngs is a solution to everything so if you look at ngs method is applicable to genome sequencing sequencing the whole genome content exome sequencing sequencing the whole exon part the among the exon and intron de novo sequencing de novo sequencing refers to sequencing of novel genome where there is no reference sequence available for alignment that is also possible now 
RNA sequencing is a highly sensitive and accurate tool for measuring expression across the transcriptome. It is providing researchers with visibility into previously undetected changes occurring in disease states under different environmental condition and across a broad range of other study designs. First of all, when you go from genome to transcriptome, your size actually reduced in a significant amount, first of all. Secondly, one set of transcriptome behave differently in different situation which could not be detected through genome sequencing that could be detected through RNA sequencing. And then chip sequencing is a powerful method for identifying genome wide DNA binding sites for transcripts and factor and other proteins which will give you the regulation as a complete picture of the regulation through the transcriptional factors. But, so uh, this is a story a lot of our teachers used to tell me I was not you know a biology student from the earlier level. I joined myself later to this business, but I heard from people who are student of genetics this story. There was in the medieval age, there was a beautiful dancer, actress, Miss Duncan, who once have sent a marriage proposal to that time considered one of the most intellectual person, novelist, actor, director, George Bernard Shaw. She wrote a letter, my dear Mr. Shaw, I beg to remind you that as you have the greatest brain in the world and I have the most beautiful body, it is our duty to posterity to have a child together. In reply to that, Barnard Shaw replied, my dear Miss Duncan, I admit that I have the greatest brain not being very polite in the world and that you have the most beautiful body. But there exists an equal probability that our child would have my body and your brain and therefore I respectfully decline. So nobody know about the truthfulness of that story, but that story clearly tells about the unpredictability of nature and unpredictability of nature starts with the process where we cannot say NGS would be successful in each and every situation, first thing. Second thing, when we have a lot of results now, we have a lot of data now, but in many cases, we actually do not have the standard to compare. So, we have seen a change, but we do not understand why these changes are happening. And that is one of the reason we have to go for further level which is the protein and go for the assemblies, the molecular machineries to form and develop. So, problems after genome sequencing project, now we have millions and billions of gene sequences which means we have that many protein sequence known. But we need to know the three dimensional structure of this protein to understand function. Now God is happy. God is thinking perhaps I do not need to change the password yet because they still have a dynamic proteome code to break. They cannot hit a moving target. So, NGS gives us a lot of opportunity open a lot of areas, we can now read the sequence, but our journey starts from here to go from sequence to structure and in the structure assemblies which are yet to be done. So, if we compare the cost analysis, what was the first genome to be sequenced through human genome project, human genome 
How long was it required to complete the first human genome sequence? 13 years, 1990 to 2003. How long did it take to sequence the first human genome? 13 years. How much did it cost to sequence the first human genome? 2.7 billion US dollar. Now it takes 7 days, even less than 7 days. 500 to 5000 USD per genome, which means 1 USD per gene less than that. Why I say 500 to 5000? Why there is a 10x? Because of purpose. When you are going for your personal purpose, 100 to 100 USD is good enough. When you are going for research purpose, you have to increase the redundancy of the data to make it more accurate because when you are going for research, you cannot even spare a single mistake. But if you could think about solving structure of a protein, it still costs three to 5,000 USD. Why is that? We will answer. That is the purpose of the course. Why the structural biology techniques are so expensive? Why? And if you see here, instead of seven days, it takes two to three years. So, why such big amount of time? All these questions, if you are having in your mind, I am happy because that was the purpose of the last few classes to generate and the fifth class of this module. These questions, this query, this interest I am generating in you is the actual goal of mine and throughout this rest of the part we will keep answering those questions. Now look at the data comparative growth of number of protein sequence to protein structure. See very interestingly this is the structure and this is sequence. If you see initially the sequence was much lower when there are time of gene sequencing, the automation was not there. And dhire dhire gradually the number of sequence are enhanced and this is this point which is marked around 2014-15 sequence pass and how it pass it goes on on and on so before going into details one thing i want to tell you see how important you know if you look at the things i told if you look at the things your teacher told in the class, most of the innovation of technologies are done much earlier than you come in the subject. So, you know, as a student, you probably think I miss the bus. Before I even come into doing science, all these innovations are done. Not for this. That's a very interesting phenomena to look about. This is a subject for your generation. This is a subject for you to explore because it is taking up in 2015, just five years earlier from where I am developing the course. That is the beauty of this subject and that is the reason I wanted to show this. So, coming back to the scene, how it works. The first protein structure of myoglobin was solved in 1958, the first protein structure database, which is PDB, was established in 1971. The first organism to have its entire genome sequence was Haemophilus influenzae in 1995. The first protein sequence database was established in 2002. So, I talked about this is PDB and this is Uniprot. I will talk about these databases. You know, database is an entire big subject, but through few slides, I want to take a glimpse of that so that you could understand. Among them, the PDB is one where structures 
are deposited so definitely this would come into our further studies but i will just talk about what is pdb a very introductory uh, thing and what are pdb id and their usage what is uniprot and what is uniprot id and its usage so before coming to these databases let's know about the database what are databases a database theoretically refers to a set of related data and the way it helps the data to be organized access to this data is usually provided by a database management system or dbms consisting of an integrated set of computer software that allows user to interact with one or more databases so a database management system or dbms includes data definition how your data uh, is like it is a pdb data means coordinate it's a sequence data means the alphabet type things are coming so what type of uh, continuous updation retrieval by the user and administration so that properly uh, it could go through few example of databases primary dna sequence database ddbg embl gene bank primary protein sequence database gene pept tr embl curated databases repsec for genomic mrna and protein data swiss prot and pir merge into uniprot which we are talking about where protein is there and structure database pdb where protein nucleic acid and viruses are there if i get opportunity in future i would want to talk about databases but not in this course so about protein data bank single worldwide database for experimentally determined structures all the experimentally solved structure have to be deposited in protein data bank or pdb key resource in the area of structural biology stores 3d structural data of biological macromolecules like protein nucleic acid as well as viruses data is submitted by structural biologists biophysicists and biochemists around the world which is freely accessible on internet and is updated weekly the mission is to maintain a single protein data bank archive of macromolecular structural data so as i told if you are working on a structure generating a pdb file electron density and all those informations your only goal is protein data bank who operate them rutgers the state university of new jersey the san diego supercomputer center at university of san diego the center for advanced research in biotechnology of the national institute of standards and technology the research collaboratory for structural bioinformatics which is called rcsb the pdb protein data bank is supported by funds from national science foundation the department of energy and the national institute of health us there are two forces let's talk about little bit history two forces one the growing collection of sets of protein structural data by x ray diffraction after the first structure myoglobin was solved a lot of people were trying and they have used the protocol established and number of structures were started solved so they thought that it would be good if we have a database where the structures would be deposited and everyone could get access to the data and then brookhaven raster display or brad which is a molecular graphics display to visualize protein structures in 3d emerged in 1968 so in one side and when i would talk about the history of structure visualization i will definitely talk about these things these stories so in one side there are growing number of structures in other side there are softwares by which you could visualize you could analyze and i always told the purpose of structural biology is to visualize biology so the first thing uh, the first attempt was started from brookhaven raster display the brad so in 1969 dr ager meyer began to write software to store atomic coordinate files in a common format to make them available for geometric and graphical evaluation 
He was working with Walton Hamilton at Brookhaven National Laboratory BNL, who actually used to fund Dr. Mayer for doing this. In 1971, one of Dr. Mayer's programs, Search Enabled Networking, that is, enabled the researcher to access information from database to study protein structures in offline. Now, definitely it is offline, not offline, it is in online. In 1973, upon Hamilton's death, Dr. Tom Kozel took over direction of PDB for 20 years. MMC project, I will again talk about this when we are talk about the PDB structure deposition formats. It's completed and structural genomics began in 1970. In 1980, IUCR, International Union of Crystallography Research Guideline established, number of structures deposited increases and independent biological databases established. For example, NDP was one of them. In October 1998, PDB was transferred to Research Collaboratory for Structural Bioinformatics, RCSB, and the complete transfer happened in 1999. Dr. Helen M. Barman of Rutgers University was now the new director after Tom Kuzzle. In 2003, with the formation of WWPDB, the PDB became an international organization having three member organizations. Again, the details we will talk later. BMRB, which is basically the de uh, like depository of NMR data, joined PDB in 2006. So, this much I talked now, I will talk in details as I told in later. Uniprot database, Uniprot is the universal protein. So, uni from universal and protein, prot is Uniprot resource, a central repository of protein data. It is a fairly accessible database of protein sequence and functional information. Uniprot is created by combining three databases, SwissProt, TREMBL, and PIRPSD, Protein Information Resources. It update in every four weeks. So, Uniprot sequences are maintained by INSDC, where Translation, translated data submitted with coding sequences, the CDS. Ensemble gene prediction and RepSec, sequences from PDB structures and direct submission and sequence form from cultures like new sequence. So, this is hailing 85 percent of the total and this is hailing 15 percent of the total contribution made in Uniprot. Now coming to Uniprot ID and PDB ID, they are very, very important for further working in the world of like protein sequence and protein structure. Uniprot ID is generally is a combination of six letters and numbers. So, you could see this is a Uniprot ID. Uniprot ID is unique for a protein. So, you take this Uniprot ID, you go to uniprot.org and put this ID and you get the information about one protein which is exclusive. Okay. So, you will see there are other Uniprot IDs here also you will see the combination of six letter and number, but sometime there are exceptions and these are two example of a different, this is the general type of Uniprot IDs, but there are exceptions where combination of 10 like letters and numbers are involved. Okay. PDB ID is unique for one protein structure. But remember that means a protein might have multiple PDBs. It is four number and letter. The first one is a number second, third and fourth are mixtures of 
either number or letter. So, these are other examples you see the first position is always number, second, third, fourth position is either number or letter. Interestingly, this number have one indication, higher the number more recent the structure is. So, this is among these three, this is oldest, this is in the mid and this is the most recent. So, again you go to PDB, you provide a PDB ID and you get the unique structure and its information. What are the information? What type of information? We will talk in the later section of the course. I will end the today's lecture here, but I just want to talk to new generation about something which you could think about your you know future career to pursue. It is about the market associated with the next generation sequencing. It is not very relevant to the course, but you know you come to study a course because you want to know things, you want to explore things. So, NGS market is a wonderful thing to know about. If you see the market is you know increasing and it is going to be 15 billion in 2025. More importantly, here in the market share of the Asian countries in 2018 was around 20 percent and personally being associated with some of the startups some of the inspiring startups, some of the people who are interested to make startup and talking with, I have realized that India or Indian market have a second boom like what happened in time of software. The reasons are the cost of consumables are drastically reducing now. Give if I provide you my example, I joined as a faculty in IIT Roorkee in 2015. The type of cost I used to pay to sequence one bacterial genome kind of reduced around 10 times in these 6 years. So, you could realize how drastic the cost reduction is. So, now it is depending on the manpower for sequencing which definitely make us you know stronger to explore because the manpower cost is definitely lower in our country. Coming to the manpower for analysis being already standing on the boom of the software having many software experts in our hand analysis people new software development people are actually much better for like already there. As I told manpower for software development and automation, exploring fields other than basic research. So, mostly sequencing was continued or explored by people like us who do basic research, but gradually it is shifting towards other applications as I told doctors are regularly prescribing now, the price is coming into our control and all those issues are happening. And uh, for other countries you know like they found software and if you think about there are two part, one the genome sequencing which is definitely a experimental part, but the next part transporting the data is again same as software. So, that is another reason and day by day more high throughput are coming, more you know booming of the market happened. So, with this 
I would finish today's lecture. Uh, I have talked about NGS, its periphery, its like correlations. In the next class, I will talk about how we are planning to solve those pro gap. We, you could probably understood that there is a huge gap. How big that gap is? Why this gap is so big? And what are our future steps? We will discuss in the next class. Thank you very much for being very, very good audience. Please be with me. Thank you.